So yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you everyone for coming in. Uh, so uh, we're very pleased to welcome Mr. Abdul Wahid uh, to uh, basically uh, chair this uh, webinar for us. And he's going to be presenting on knee biomechanics relating to uh, total knee arthroplasty. And uh, Mr. Abdul Wahid is a consultant orthopedic surgeon at the Meet at South Essex Foundation Trust and uh, and Nafu Health Brentwood Hospital as well. And he specializes in hip and knee disorders doing primary and as well as uh, complex arthroplasty surgery. On top of that, he also does ACL reconstruction, arthroscopic knee surgery, including meniscal repair, and as well as ACL reconstruction. And uh, Mr. Wahid's main research interest lies in rapid recovery program after joint replacement. So this is perfect webinar. And, to highlight his uh, knowledge to us. So welcome Mr. Mr. Wahid to give us Thanks. a talk on the, the subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think today I'm going to speak about uh, uh, knee biomechanics uh, as it relates to the knee orthoplasty. It's a quite complex topic and all of you know that and there are a lot of controversies where we should cut the bone and uh, how we should cut the bone. I'll try my best to make it as simple as possible so at least you can understand and pass your exam. So basically, what is the aim of uh, total knee replacement? For patient perspective, patient needs pain control and patient needs restoration of the function of the knee so patient can have a normal uh, uh, knee functions. But from our side, how we can achieve that is basically we need to restore the neutral or mechanical alignment of the limb. We need to restore the joint lines so the preserved ligament like medial, MCL, LCL, and if we are preserving PCL, they function properly. We need to have a balanced uh, soft tissue envelope around the knee so there will be a correct flexion extension gaps. And last but not the least, we need to restore the normal Q angle so that patient can have a normal uh, 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 tablet tracking. Before we go into the details of our surgical cuts, I think it would be nice to just review the anatomy of femur, tibia, and the knee itself very quickly. The femur has got two mechanical, sorry, two axes. One is called anatomical, which basically is the literally bisects the medullary canal of the femur. The mechanical axis is, is actually passes through the center of the femoral head and the center of the uh, knee or the center of the distal end of the femur. So these two basically make uh, angle with each other of about uh, five to seven degrees. And this angle is called like a valgus angle, which basically is angle five to six degree of the uh, uh, anatomical axis of the femur. So in tibia, the things are slightly simple and uh, the tibial anatomical and mechanical axis are actually the same. They pass from the center of the tibia on the top and center of the ankle distally. So there the mechanical axis of the limb itself it's a line passes from the center of the femoral head, center of the femur, uh, knee, and across center of the ankle joint. So that's the mechanical axis, and that's literally very important for us to understand uh, at this stage. So it will help us in future how we really need to make our uh, surgical cuts. Knee actually makes about three to five degrees of physiological uh, valgus angle to the femur. If you remember your selenius curve from pediatric knowledge, the child is born with like various knees as he grow up, it goes to the uh, valgus and then stays back to five, like three to five degrees of valgus for the rest of the life. The top of the tibia basically is not like a flat. It has got three degree, whereas that's a natural uh, uh, top of the tibia. So if with the anatomical or mechanical axis, because in tibia they're the same, it makes a three degree of virus uh, uh, cut. So what is virus and what is valgus? We know that if the 
and if, if the mechanical axis of the limb passes medial to the center of the knee is varus deformity if it passes lateral to the center of the knee it's a valgus deformity why we need to know about the anatomic and mechanical axis of the femur that's literally very very important here for all of us to understand how we really make our cuts Basically, where, where these two axes is, the mechanical axis of femur, which is yellow, and the anatomical axis, which is green, where they meet, slightly meet in the middle or slightly medial to the middle of the uh, uh, trochlea. This, uh, sorry, the, the, the notch of the femur, basically, that's the point where we pass our, and like the, uh, the femoral, canal, uh, femoral rod. So that's our entry point. So that's, we need to know exactly where the axes are. We use the femur as a, our reference point. We, use, we put a femoral rod inside, but we make a cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the, uh, of the femur. So basically we need to turn our jig five to seven degrees into vulgus so we can achieve distal femoral cut, which should be perpendicular to the uh, mechanical axis of the femur. So that's why it's important. So this is called distal valgus uh, cut angle, basically. So if somebody is very tall, five feet, uh, six feet, uh, five inches or something, this is just really arbitrary, we might need to have a small angle. If it's somebody's short stature, we need to increase the angle. So when you do a distal cut angle, basically your femoral component will be facing towards the femoral head. That's really very important. When you do next time a knee replacement, just have a look. Because it has to be like mechanically neutral or perpendicular to the mechanical axis of the femur, not the anatomical axis. Okay. That's where we want to achieve. There's your neutral, we need to restore the neutral mechanical axis of the limb. Uh, by, by our cuts or our uh, uh, tissue balancing, right? If uh, the idea basically is that the, the load should transmit from medial and lateral side equally. If there's a, if it's a varus or valgus, it can cause a excessive amount of uh, load going on one side and it can cause uh, wear of the uh, polyethylene. So in tibial alignment, if as we know, the tibial, the top end of the tibia has got three degree varus uh, with the mechanical axis of the tibia. The proximal tibia, we normally cut 90 degree to the mechanical axis. So by doing so, it actually takes more on the lateral and less on the medial side. We will we'll come back, I mean, with the next few slides, you will see how we make the cuts. But at the moment, this more important thing, which I need to really discuss, is the ligament balancing. This is extremely uh, crucial, really, for the success of a knee replacement. If you have soft tissue envelope around the knee, medial lateral, lateral ligaments, they're not balanced well. People can have instability and can have a, a pain and uh, early wear of the prosthesis. We know that the osteoarthritis can cause scarring of the ligaments. Ligaments can be contracted. On one side can be attenuated. So we need to have a balancing of the knee in both coronal as well as the sagittal planes. So in coronal plane, we know the deformity. It is a varus or valgus. In varus deformity, obviously the medial side of the, uh, the medial side of the knee, the structure will be contracted will have more scarring. On the lateral side, they will be attenuated and stretched. There might be a bone loss on the medial side because of the wear of the bone. So how you achieve, how you actually basically do the releases on the medial side to align your limb. You always start with simple things. They take the osteophyte first, then the deep um, MCL. And don't forget the MCL is uh, attached to the medial meniscus. So when you're taking the meniscus, be careful. Uh, don't take the MCL with it. And uh, if that helps you, that's fine. Otherwise, you might need to go to the posteromedial aspect of the knee to release the capsule and maybe semimembranosis uh, tendon. Semimembranosis tendon attaches to the posteromedial aspect of the knee, uh, of the tibia. 
Samiti or Samiti denotes is, is actually part of the past sense Venus. Okay, so the in coronal plane, the other deformity is the valgus deformity, which basically the concavity is on the lateral side and is convex on the medial side. So whenever you're doing this um, kind of joints, always, always examine the competency of the MCL. The MCL has to be competent, then you can do a very simple primary, otherwise you might need to do a bit more constrained uh, prosthesis. So and similarly, in the lateral side, start with the simple, like taking the osteophytes, lateral capsule release, iliotibial band, maybe for pleteus tendon, might need to release it. And uh, last is a lateral collateral ligament. If you release a lateral collateral ligament, do sub, uh, uh, like a subperiosteal from the fem femoral side and uh, don't try to detach. If you, some people, there's a lot of advocation you do advocate about the you detach and put a screw here. If you do that, best is to do a constraint knee. So sagittal plane balancing, which actually is flexion extension of gap, it has to be symmetrical and uh, equal. Just a little give you idea, the, the, the technique I'm discussing is called mechanical alignment technique. There are kinematic alignment techniques, which we might touch upon at the end if we have a time. The, what we're saying is that whatever the cuts we are doing or I'm talking about is called mechanical alignment techniques to do the knee replacement, all right? So in flexion extension, uh, coming back to flexion extension gap, the flexion gap basically depends upon the posterior femoral cut, tibial cut, and the PCL. If the PCL is very tight, you know, it can really affect your uh, flexion gap. Why we need symmetrical gaps basically is that they give you smooth range of movement and stability to the, your joint. And uh, uh, the longevity of the prosthesis actually depends on these things and better pain relief. The, the other gap is the extension gap, which actually is, uh, depends on the distal femoral cord tibial cord and uh, posterior capsule. If your posterior capsule is very tight and uh, that can cause a, a, a flexion gap problem. There, we know that if your problem in symmetrical, both in flexion and extension, you need to adjust the tibia first. If the problem is asymmetrical, the gap, flexion gap is different than the extension gap, then adjust the femur first. There are quite a few scenarios and they are all given in various books uh, and then given in the Miller as well. If the tight extension, tight inflection, we didn't cut the enough tibia, so cut the tibia a bit more and that really will resolve the problem. Similarly, if it's loose in extension and loose in flexion, probably we have cut too much tibia, so either use a thicker polyethylene insert or metallic tibial augments. This is very literally in primary setting you rarely see people using metallic tibial arguments. Most of the time you can get away with using thicker polyethylene insert. If your extension is good, but the loose and flexion is asymmetric gap, and we probably have got too much of the back of the femur, either you increase the femoral component or translate anteriorly or posteriorly. It's, it's not easy to translate really literally. They, most of the time you can get away by using a smaller size of the femur. If it's tight in extension, but flexion is good, it could be the reason that the posterior capsule is still very tight, we haven't released it properly, or we didn't cut the distal femur uh, properly. Either release the posterior capsule and see if that helps, or uh, take off the distal uh, uh, femur one to two millimeter extra. If this extension is good, but tight and flexion, again, we didn't cut probably posterior bone. The PCL is probably very much scarred or there's no posterior slope in the tibia. So you start one by one, do with release, release bit, little bit, little bit of the PCL from the uh, femur, that probably might help you or you can decrease the size of the femur. Similarly, loose and extension, flexion is good. Again, it's asymmetrical. Cut too much of distal femur or there's an AP size is too big, 
either you do distal augmentation or put thicker polyethylene insert and then readdress as if there's a tight flexion gap. So what next actually is very uh, important aspect of uh, a knee replacement, whether we should retain the PCL or we should sacrifice the PCL. There's a lot of literature in favor of both and a lot of studies in favor in, in terms of their survivorship, in terms of their uh, functional outcome. I think there's not much difference in terms of long-term, uh, uh, I mean, outcome of these uh, prostheses. However, we can have a little, I mean, discussion on the, if we retain PCL, the advantages are that probably there's more arc of motion. There's, Intact PCL obviously prevent subluxation of the tibia, and uh, there's a femoral rollback. The femoral rollback basically is that if you look at the picture, as the knee flexes, the contact point between femur and tibia moves backward if you go along this. So that's a femoral rollback. PCL retaining does help this one, but you probably need a flatter kind of polyethylene uh, uh, tray to achieve that. The other benefits, I mean, there's less chances of flexion stability. This is really uh, questionable. And uh, stability is increased. The femur which does not jump anteriorly because the PCL is intact. Proprioception is better, probably. And what are the disadvantages? Rollback, actually, is, is, is does really roll back in PCL retaining. The rollback needs both ACL and PCL intact. In reality, when we retain PCL, there's a rollback as well as there's a sliding as well. So it's a combination of two movements. Okay. But you need to have achieved a proper rollback, you need a flatter, like a flat polyethylene. But that's really very detrimental because flat polyethylene have a contact point and there's a stress will be very high and there will rapid polyethylene wear. So to combat that, we normally use congruent polyethylene, but it does give little rollback. I mean, it does provide, and it is definitely congruent polyethylene reduces the stresses because the surface area of contact is more and uh, the stress will be less. PCL substituting, yes, it has got uh, its own benefits. Uh, this is the CAM. Actually, it articulates with the post and it acts like kind of PCL, basically. So there are a few areas where people actually advocate strongly that we should use the PCL substituting or PCL sacrificing the implant. Like if there's a previous pet patellectomy, there's a potential risk of instability uh, because uh, the extensions are weak. If you remember that uh, patellectomy can in patellectomy, the quadriceps has to exert about 30% extra force to achieve the same amount of work or achieve the same amount of movement. So uh, inflammatory arthropathy like uh, rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis, uh, people say they, they can cause uh, later on a, a PCL rupture because of the in inflammatory process and you should use PCL, however, Literate, there's a lot of disparity in literature. Uh, uh, people still sometimes use uh, uh, PCL uh, retaining. So if there's a deficient or absent PCL, yes, you, you can use that PCL substituting. The advantages are probably maybe easy to balance the knee with PC, absent PCL. Arguably, they say there's a more range of motion. They're, whether that's true or not, they, there's a lot of debate on it. Really, the uh, easy, easy surgical exposures. The disadvantage you need to be very careful in bal you need to be very careful in balancing the in either case, whether it's a, a literally a CR or a PS. In both cases, but in in uh, uh, PCL substituting, if your knee is uh, loose in flexion, there can be a cam jump. If I, I can give you a little more explanation here. If there's a P if the flexion is loose here. It will the femur will jump over the post and it will happen like that. And that will be your X-rays. So that's a cam jump. That's one of the complications in 
uh, PCL substituting. The other complication, which is quite common, is the patellar clunk syndrome. Basically, what happens when you are placing the patella, the this soft tissue is formed on the superior pole of the patella under the quadriceps tendon, and that scar tissue becomes like a quite big, thick nodule, and uh, clunk over the uh, uh, the box of the the notch of the femoral component. It can be painful or it can be very nuisance for the patient. Every time the patient moves about 45, 40 degrees for extension, it feels very uh, like sudden uh, uh, click in the knee. If there's not much symptoms, leave it. If it's really symptomatic, then you might need to go arthroscopic resection of the nodule. So now actually I will go into the details about the cuts, how we make it. If you understand the telofemoral articulation, the most common problem in knee replacement is the maltracking of the patella. That, and uh, the most common reason probably is the femoral uh, internal rotation of the component. The, we know the Q angle is from the line drawn from the anterior iliac spine to the mid of the patella, from mid of the patella, to the tibial tubercle. It's a mid of the patella, guys, by definition, not the superior pole of the patella. Some examiner are quite fussy. So the Q angle, basically, is literally very important to, to be maintained. It's, it's, it's higher on, in, in females, less in males, about 13 degrees in, female, uh, in male, and about nearly 18 degrees in female. So, these are the different uh, muscles acting on the patella. Vastus medial, medialis, obliquus vastus medialis and lateralis. The resultant vector is actually pulling upward straight. So that's why the patella is actually kept in trochlea. Okay, so increase uh, acute angle basically is associated with the lateral subluxation of the patella. So our goal is to achieve a normal Q angle. So how we can achieve that or how we can prevent abnormal uh, patellar tracking? On femur side, we need to avoid femoral component uh, internal rotation. So don't, do not put femoral component uh, which, which internally rotated. Do not medialize the femoral component. Either put the femoral component neutral or externally rotated or put the femoral component in the center of the distal femur or slightly lateral. How can we achieve that while we are operating? There are different uh, landmarks which are available to us to use to actually make our cuts properly. It's the AP axis of the femur, epicondylar and posterior condylar axis. We'll go one by one. If you look at the picture for, on the top, that's the AP axis, which passes from the deep part of the trochlea up to the notch, is also called wide side line. Your anterior and posterior cut should be perpendicular to this axis. Then come the epicondylar axis, which actually runs across the two medial and lateral epicondyles, which are easily palpable in primary knee replacement. Your cuts, anterior and the posterior, should be parallel to this one. The third one is the, the posterior condylar axis, which actually runs posteriorly, but your anterior and posterior cut should be three degree externally rotated to this line. Which axis we commonly use? It's very important. We commonly use the posterior condylar axis because that's where the jigs actually, the feet of the jigs rest on, and then from there, we make our all adjustments. So, that's why in most of the uh, prosthesis, we externally rotate three to five degrees. So coming back to like the femoral, femoral cut, the, we know the medial femoral condyle is actually slightly larger, larger and extends distally as compared to the lateral side. And the top end of the tibia makes a three degree varus uh, uh, cut here. So we cut the tibia perpendicular to the anatomical or mechanical axis of the tibia, which are the same. By doing so, we're cutting more on the lateral side, less on the medial side. 
but the femoral side we need to cut perpendicular to the mechanical axis, which was coming from the femoral head to the center of the uh, distal femur. By doing so, we cut more on the medial and less on the lateral, and resultant will be a rectangular extension gap. So that's what we need. Okay, to match that, we need a similar rectangular reflection gap as well. How we can do it? You need to externally rotate your jig three degrees because you are taking the posterior reference. We'll we will discuss in a minute anterior and posterior reference. We're using these as a reference, posterior condyle, we have a feet of the jig. So we externally rotate so that we'll cut more on the medial, less on the lateral posterior femoral condyles. There are a few designs, guys, which actually have got a trapezoidal flexion gap, which is next, uh, Gen 2, if you remember that. But that's a different philosophy we'll, we, will have, we can discuss later on. So idea is that we should have rectangular flexion as well as extension gaps, and they should be symmetrical and equal. Okay, on the TPL side, what, what we can do to prevent uh, uh, femoral uh, maltracking, the TPL component, the center of that should lie at the junction of medial third and lateral two third of the TPL tubercle. If you internally rotate the tibial component, when you extend the knee, the knee will externally rotate and the tibial tubercle will go laterally and it will increase the Q angle and will actually cause a subluxation of the patella. So tibial component, medial one third and lateral two third of the tibial tubercle. For resurfacing patella, always put patella medial. It helps provide avoiding uh, patella baha, which can uh, which can cause a uh, uh, problem with the flexion. So next, uh, what referencing uh, technique we should use, anterior or posterior? Does not make any difference. Whatever you do, the idea is to achieve like the correct rotation of the femoral component and the size of the femoral component. I can tell you one thing important. I mean, there, they have a lot of matters of doing anterior referencing, posterior referencing, referencing. There's no right and wrong. I always do posterior referencing. My many colleagues do anterior as well. But the, at the end of the day, you need to achieve a proper sizing and the rotation of the femoral component. I wrote in uh, like in red, if you're, when you're doing the femoral sizing, if your size matches like with the AP diameter, especially with the component, like say the size five, then doesn't matter, you use anterior or posterior referencing, you're cutting the same amount anteriorly and posteriorly over the femur. If your uh, the measuring measurement matches with the component available. However, if the AP diameter of the femur, femoral condyle is in between the sizes, say between four and five, then using different referencing will cause different, uh, will cut the different amount of bone interiorly and posterior. It all depends on which referencing technique you use. So if I, if you have got, for example, four and five, okay? And you, you want to use the size, you decided to use size, size five. If you're, when you measure it, your size, size is between four and five. The in posterior referencing, you will cut same amount always in the posterior, posterior referencing. The post, same amount will be cut posteriorly in posterior referencing. If you are using size five jig, your, your prosthesis will be very prominent here. It will, lift, will be lifted off the femur and you will stuff the femoral joint. But if you use 
size 4 in posterior referencing, you still will be cutting the same amount posteriorly up here, but the uh, the anterior it will it can cause the nerve chain. You understand? This is very important. Okay. Similarly, if you're using anterior referencing, and if you use size five, size five, the anteriorly it will lie quite nicely over the femur. In anterior referencing, uh, whatever size you use, you're cutting the same amount anteriorly. It's a posterior which we cut more or less. But if you use size five in anterior referencing, you cut whatever amount you can cut, it will nicely flush with the femur. Posteriorly, you will cut too little and there will be tight flexion gap. On the other hand, if you use smaller size, anteriorly the same amount of bone is cut. However, posteriorly, you will cut too much of bone like a, up here, the red line, and there can be a flexion gap instability. So these two techniques, they're very, very important uh, for you to understand. It doesn't matter whichever technique you use, whether anterior referencing or posterior referencing. The idea is that you should have chosen appropriate size and accurate rotational alignment of the femoral component. That's literally the key here uh, message. The, if there's any malrotated femoral component, they have a poor patellar tracking, they can have an interior knee pain, loss of motion, loss of function, and implant, implant can fail. So knee designs, I mean, they are, it's quite, it, it, this really needs, an, it's a, by its own, it's really a full topic, but I can just little go through with the unconstrained and constrained. Unconstrained is the crucial retaining and crucial substituting. Constrained one is hinged or non-hinged. It can be fixed versus mobile bearing. It, it leads really itself uh, have separate lectures to be honest. So there are different uh, method of uh, doing the balancing or uh, doing uh, the cutting the in uh, the bones. In majority of the cases, we do mechanically aligned techniques with measured resection. Most of the people do this. However, some people use gap balancing. The techniques so far we have used using the APX of the femur, transapicular axis of the femur, and the posterior canal axis of the femur, that actually is called measured resection technique. You measured with the jigs and you know where you're cutting, okay? And you know how much external rotation you want to actually create inside. So you actually, from the jig, you do yourself. That's why it's called a measured resection technique. In gap balancing, you balance the ligaments, release, do the releases, do the tibial cut first, then you put a jig inside and put a femoral jig inside as well. There's a different jig. Then you bring the knee to 90 degree. Whatever the femoral component rotates externally, or whatever the degrees, you fix it and then cut it. That's called gap balancing. We are eight consultants doing hips and knees. One does gap, gap balancing on the rest all the measured. There's no right and wrong. Both techniques are good. So in summary, what we need to achieve, we need to achieve that patient should be pain-free and patient should have a restoration of the function of the knee. Well, how can we achieve that? Basically, we need to achieve the proper anatomy and the ligament tension in the knee arthroplasty. So there were a few other actually, uh, I didn't really, I, I think it needs again a separate lecture. Computer assisted surgery, robotics, virtual reality softwares, pressure sensors and all these things, they need to have like separate. I just put that, that you should know that there are a few other things in the knee replacement as well. Now comes the questions, and I think Justin uh, probably have done it. So um, uh, I'm ready to go through with, with you with the poll and also the questions, if you like to. Yeah, I think, um, shall we go through the questions now? So I would be appreciate if everybody can go through and the questions that now turn up in front of you <clears throat> and then just answer as, uh, as soon as you can. 
Mm -hmm. Which of the following defines the mechanical axis of a normally aligned limb? The, I think the most of them, they're correct. The vertical line drawn from the femoral head through the center of the knee down to the center of the ankle. So majority are correct. Uh, second, uh, when performing a, a knee orthoplasty, the knee is stable in full extension, but it will not flex beyond 90 degrees and uh, flexion is tight. Which of the following adjustment can achieve satisfactory range of motion and stability in flexion and extension? I think they all, 82% said downsizing the femoral component, which I think is correct. Uh, next is that during the trial reduction in the TKR, the surgeon was unable to fully extend the knee and that the TBL tray lifts off when the knee is flexed past 90 degrees. What technique should be taken to obtain a balanced knee in flexion and extension? Uh, resect more proximal tibia, I think that's correct. And the 66% are right. Uh, in total knee orthoplasty, an excessive posterior femoral resection will lead to which of the following situation? Loose flexion gap, yes, 91% answers correctly. During trialing in primary knee or total knee orthoplasty, the knee does not extend in to full, but the flexion gap is nicely balanced. After appropriate soft tissue releases have been performed, what is the next most suitable step to balance the joint? Uh, here, uh, what they have done. Resect more distal femurs, 10, 73% people answered, and I think that's correct answer. Well done. Most of them has been clarified during your lecture. So there were questions about gap balancing versus measured resection. I think you've explained it quite well and the candidate is quite happy from that point of view. <clears throat> um, and certainly I think the next question, um, sorry, I lost it now. So. Uh, so there was a question from Mr. Adnan, uh, who talks about when the trowel has been inserted into the knee and the knee is stable in extension, but in flexion, the medial part feels a bit tight, more than lateral, and the poly doesn't seem to fit in on the medial side. Uh, I guess it must be due to do with his personal experience. It seems very, very specific about his question. So, <laughs> so he's, he's asking yeah. what to do next. I think the medial side is tight. They probably, if there are a few things which can happen, either the medial releases are not sufficient that you need to address. If there are any osteophytes, so take them down. And uh, maybe your cut is more into vulgus, tibial cut. So you have to relook at that and see if your cut is correct, really. Because if, there's a, if your tibial cut is like in vulgus, you cut more on the lateral, less on the medial, that can cause also this problem. So there are multiple really things which you need to look into. There's not one single uh, thing. Right. Yeah, agree. I think I think also if you're thinking about it being balanced extension, perhaps you need to be concerned that maybe your femur is in internal rotation as well, which is why on flexion your 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 medial side tighter. So certainly I think uh, you just have to really look at all your rotation, make sure that's correct as well. Uh, so and I think. There is another question. There's a question from Mr. Ghazi, who is talking about rollback phenomenon. So he's asking about, is the rolling back a normal phenomenon that you need to achieve with the implant or you need to avoid? And what's the significance? Yeah, yeah. the rollback in normal knee, when there's ACL, PCL is intact, that's a normal phenomenon. That's your physiological, uh, like something which happens in the knee. When we do knee replacement, the modern one, we sacrifice one or the both, ACL or the PCL. In ACL, when you uh, sacrifice ACL, which we normally do in CR, uh, like uh, retaining. So in that case, it's not a true rollback, but yes, it does cause some sort of rollback because the hinge, one hinge in the back is intact, which is PCL. It does actually force the femur to roll back. But as I said in my talk, it's not 100% true rollback. There's also some slide as well with it. So to have a pure rollback phenomena, you need a flat polyethylene, which we can't afford. That will be very unstable. We need a congruent. We always even CR, we use congruent uh, 
a polyethylene, which basically the, the flat surface can cause contact, point contact, and can cause point loading, which is more stress on one point and can cause a rapid failure. So it's a com this is literally compromise in both. Yes, we, we, we aim to achieve rollback, but not 100%. Yeah, I think that's correct. So, um, and uh, so one final question is, uh, I guess the answer probably, yeah. So does the tibia slope affect gap balancing? Mr. Nimesh has asked, uh, does the tibia slope affect gap balancing? Basically, in, in, when you do get gap balancing, you, you, you're using, uh, basically, first you release your soft tissue, do the tibial cut as you need to do, Three, three degree or seven degree posterior slope, whichever uh, implant you're using the prosthesis. In Gen 2, you'll use uh, three. In next gen, you use seven degree. It depends really how much. If, uh, if it's too much, obviously, uh, posterior slope, your, gap, your balancing will definitely be affected. Okay. So you have to be really, uh, you have to like balancing both both sides. You can't really have too much stress slope with a view to have achieve more flexion. You need to keep with your prosthesis you're using in a way that you can achieve the balancing in the soft tissue. So when you have done that, you know, you put the jig in, then femoral component, wherever it goes, it will go. It, it's a, out of your control. So it moves with the tibial uh, jig. And that way you fix the component, femoral jig, and then you resect it. I think it does. I think the most important is to get the, the posterior slope correct, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And so I think uh, there's a couple more questions, but I think we probably got to start uh, doing the Viva session. And I guess uh, I, we will, so we can try and answer it on a chat function. Uh, I don't know what you think, David, for time oh, purposes. We can answer them through the chat function. Uh, yeah. People... Yes, yeah, not a problem. So okay. we'll let um, Mr. Hughes take over the screen and uh, just do, we've got three volunteers. In fact, we've got four volunteers today, but I think we've got time for three. Um, and uh, we'll let the first one 